Hi, and welcome to the Behavioral Health News Spotlight and Excellence Series, where we feature exceptional leaders and innovative healthcare solutions that are raising the standards of care in the behavioral health community. My name is David Minot, and I am the Executive Director of Mental Health News Education, the nonprofit organization that publishes behavioral health news and autism spectrum news. Our mission is devoted to improving lives and the delivery of care for people living with mental illness, substance use disorder, and autism, while also supporting their families and the professional communities that serve them by providing a trusted source of science-based education, information, advocacy, and quality resources. Today, we're speaking with Mitchell Netburn, President and CEO of Samaritan Daytop Village a nonprofit organization that has been improving the quality of life for New Yorkers for over 60 years with addiction and mental health treatment and supportive housing. Mitchell, thanks so much for being here with us today. Thank you so for, much for having me and uh, for focusing on Samaritan Data Village. Oh, it's a pleasure. So how about we begin um, with uh, maybe talking about the mission of Samaritan Daytop Village and sharing an overview of the services provided and the people served. Sure. Um, our mission is, uh, is uh, pretty uh, simple. It's to help people help themselves. Uh, that's, that's really what we're about, uh, giving them the tools to overcome whatever challenges they have and, you know, really doing it in a client-centered way, meaning asking our clients what are their goals and what is the best way for them to reach that. We don't have a cookie-cutter approach. Um, we provide really a full range of services. Uh, we like to say we're from crinkle to wrinkle, meaning you know we we serve little kids and you know lots of pregnant moms and all the way to to seniors. Um, and you know our main uh, you know areas of focus is certainly substance use disorder. Um, you know we have just a full range of of substance use disorder services, residential treatment, outpatient clinics, recovery centers. Um, you know lots of things going on on the streets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, we've, over the, you know, many years, we've also added mental health services, understanding the link between those two, uh, even before it be became the sort of, you know, you know policy of government. Um, we operate a large number of shelters um, for both single men, single women, and families. Um, we have a senior center. We run a few, uh, two proprietary schools for youth with behavioral health issues. Uh, employment programs, education programs. Um, so we really like to say, you know, pretty much uh, people in need, uh, you know, we can offer them, you know, whatever services they need to help them live independent, fully productive lives. Wonderful. So uh, you uh, you keep busy. Uh, I think that's <laughs> uh, easy to say. Um, so I've read about that Samaritan has opened uh, a few new facilities in the past year. Uh, perhaps you can tell us about the Richard Pruss Wellness Center and why this is a transformative addition to an underserved community. Sure. You know, first of all, a little bit of history. Richard Pruss uh, was the sort of de facto uh, founder of Samaritan Daytop Village and was our first and very long term uh, CEO. And really, you know, he was a visionary and understood early on that you couldn't just treat substance use disorder, that it was closely linked with mental health issues in many cases and really full wraparound services. And so he was really the one who expanded our portfolio to include those other areas. Um, so one, the building is named after him in honor of his uh, legacy, but also it is a physical embodiment of really his philosophy. And what I mean by that is we have a very large number of services co-located in one single building that was purpose-built for us um, that's, you know, a beautiful building uh, in itself. And I think that's part of it is that it's a place where clients come into and, and feel immediately uh, sort of a sense of respect and dignity that, you know, it's, it's, it's very appealing, very sort of client centered and friendly. Um, but, you know, the, the range of programs we have in there, uh, we have an outpatient mental health clinic. We have an outpatient substance use disorder clinic. Uh, we run our methadone clinic uh, there. Um, we're soon to open a licensed uh, Article 28 medical clinic for you know, physical health issues. Um, we have uh, a recovery center for people who've been through treatment uh, and making sure to give them the tools they need 
to continue um, their, their path to, uh, on recovery. Um, we also have a central admissions office where the idea is no wrong door. Somebody comes in and rather than saying, no, we don't, you know, this is not the place for you. You have to go here, take a train, a bus, um, is we can find the best place for them, help arrange transportation for them. Um, so in some, the idea is, is really one-stop shopping. Um, there's so many programs, I've, I left out one, which is also we have our health home case management program there. Um, and so the idea is that, you know, the clients, if they want to receive all those services from Samaritan Data Village, it's there in one building. Um, they just go up and down the elevator. Uh, we can really coordinate those services, warm handoffs, um, and just, you know, much, you know, better outcomes and, and much better sort of, you know, customer service, so to, so to speak, uh, having that all in one building. So um, it's really, you know, we've tried to do that in different ways, but, you know, this building is, as I said, is the sort of physical embodiment of that vision. Um, and it has, you know, been it, it tremendously embraced uh, by clients as well as our staff. And there's also more now interactions between our staff. So you really get that teamwork approach. Yeah, congratulations on that. Uh, another opportunity where you got to break out the big scissors uh, for a, you know, a ribbon cutting uh, was the recently opened Bronx Support and Community uh, Connection Center. Okay. Um, what services are being provided there and, and what impact will this have on community members with mental health and or substance yeah. use disorders? So there's also a tremendous number of services in, in that facility, but it's a smaller program and it's really one of two pilots that the city of New York, um, you know, has funded. And the idea is really that the people brought to the, the support and connection center uh, would be brought at least initially by the New York City police officers who encounter somebody on the street or a call they respond to that it's exhibiting some behavioral health issue, whether mental health and or a substance use disorder one, you know, that doesn't rise to the level they need to go to emergency room, nor that they need to be arrested for. So public nuisance, urinating on the street, walking in traffic, you know, harassing people, things like that. Um, and, you know, it's a very rich service model um, so that the people that are brought there, whatever issue that they're, they're exhibiting can be treated. So we can do detox on site. We can provide mental health services. We can do a full physical examination. Many of the people that I refer to are gonna have chronic health issues on top of it. Um, you know, full range of, of you know, substance use disorder services. Um, they can also stay there for up to five days with maybe you know, additional five uh, beyond that. So it is not a shelter. It's not a residential program. It's really sort of short-term, deal with the, the person who's exhibiting that behavior, stabilize them, get them what they need immediately. Again, not making a referral because they may never get to that other place. And if they do, you know, if it's, let's say, an emergency room, they may get, you know, lost with, you know, people who might be exhibiting more severe conditions. Um, and then, you know, a critical component is then linking them to whatever services they need beyond those five or 10 days uh, to ensure that, you know, they're continuing with whatever, whatever uh, program is, is best suited to them. Uh, and also we have an open door policy. They can always come back, um, you know, understanding that issues of mental health and, and substance use disorder, just like any other health issue, um, there's ups and downs, there's relapses. Um, we never view those as failures. The doors are always open. They can always come back to that support and connection center. So and I think, you know, the, oh, I'm sorry. No, please go ahead. Uh, and, you know, the second part of your question is, you know, the impact of the community is, you know, when we met with the com community, um, in, conjunction with the community board initially, yeah, there was some concerns about this. Um, you know, the original mm -hmm. idea is as many people from the immediate community would be brought to the center, over time it will expand. But once the community understood it, you know, they started saying, can, can we make referrals? Um, you mm -hmm. know, the city, not, we're not quite there yet, but um, I think it will have a positive impact. And, and I remember saying to them, you probably know many of these people who are gonna come here. You know, you've seen them. Um, and um, so I think, you know, over time it will have a, a very positive impact on not just that local community, but broader as we expand our geographic uh, catchment area. Sure. Um, with so many services in one place for both of these facilities, it must be a bit of a staffing challenge. Mm -hmm. 
It is. Is that, yeah, that, that you is. having issues with the short workforce shortages? Uh, yes, I mean, we are. I mean, you know, that is you, you, uh, you, a problem that uh, not just everybody in our industry is facing, but, you know, it is a truly a worldwide phenomenon in all industries. Um, so that certainly is a challenge. Um, mm. You know, I, you know, certainly uh, telephonic and telehealth type services, you know, um, have a big impact on that. Um, again, having, you know, multiple programs in one facility, you can, you know, kind of, you know, shift resources a little bit more freely. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, you know, have to deal with sure. transportation issues. Um, so it is a challenge, but, you know, just like, you know, it's not, not the first and the only challenge um, uh, that, uh, you know, we have faced and uh, you just have to deal with it creatively, but it, it is a, it is a big challenge. Um, and, you know, the burden really falls on the staff we have. And so I just have to commend our staff, uh, you know, Absolutely. you know, in addition to, you know, Working through the pandemic, uh, but you know they were true heroes and heroines. Uh, but also, they're they're really working, uh, you know, really in sort of a, a situation where we're not fully staffed and it puts additional burden. But you know, they, yeah, they've risen uh, to that challenge. So, speaking of the pandemic, um, so how, how did the, how did we're still? I mean, it's never officially over, but you know, when it was really in the 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 the, uh, the 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 most difficult parts of the COVID pandemic. How did that shape the way that you guys are now operating? Sure, you know, so I think it's it had some you know lasting impact, and frankly, you know, you had to say something positive came out of the pandemic, but some positive things. So as I just mentioned, I think one of the things was, you know, the pivot to uh, telephonic and telehealth mm -hmm. services. Um, you know, that was dramatic overnight, um, and I have to applaud. You know, uh, particularly you know, state government for allowing you know making very quick rule changes. Things that might have taken ten years happened in ten days, um, and um, I think that's more efficient use of some you know professionals' time uh, because they're not spending time traveling. And then also, especially now that we have the workforce shortage, again makes more efficient use of, of the the staff that we do have. So that's certainly one thing. And in general, clients have really responded to that very well. Uh, in, you know, we still offer and certainly we've gone back to in-person services, but, you know, give people a choice. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think, you know, globally, it's a little bit of a less of a paternalistic view uh, of clients. Um, I think that's how the sort of system was structured. And so I'll, I'll use our methadone clinics uh, as an example. You know, many people have to come every day to get their methadone. Certain people always, you would give them a several day supply, rare occasions up to 28 days. Well, at the beginning of the pandemic, we didn't want people coming in every day. Um, and, and so you, we sort of, you know, had to make those judgment calls about giving many, many of our clients, you know, longer term uh, dosage or multiple days. Um, and we've probably gone back a little now to, you know, trying people come in a bit more, but not all the way. Um, and so again, more, you know, it's, it's, clients prefer that. And it's also, you know, sort of a sense of trust that, you know, you can manage your own life um, right. and more independent. Um, you know, we saw that in, in our shelters, our, the, the city really, um, the height of the pandemic, moved many of the clients from congregate shelters where you had 10, 15, 20 people in one, sleeping in one room to hotels where there were two, two people a room. And I have to be honest, we were... At, you know, uh, sort of concerned about that. Many of our clients have serious mental health issues, active substance users, we know that. All of a sudden now they're behind a closed door and you can't see them. Um, and, um, you know, the good news was we had very, very few issues. And I think it was the same thing. There was a sense of, well, I've got my own room. I want to, you know, keep it a certain way. I want to, you know, stay like this. So uh, I think overall um, it really kind of, um, you know, empowered our clients more. Um, and then also, you know, allowed our staff to be a bit more sort of efficient. Um, and, you know, we, you know, we've, I would say, you know, pivoted a little bit to remote work, but not for all staff. Um, you know, many of our jobs are, you've, you've got to be there 24 um, seven. Yeah. But I think, you know, in those ways, it's, it's made a profound but positive uh, impact. So uh, just switching gears for a moment, uh, we're all well aware of the recent migrant crisis in New York City. Um, and I know Samaritan does uh, a lot with supportive housing. Um, so uh, what role has Samaritan Daytop Village played to support all these asylum seekers that have been recently arriving from Latin America? Yep. Um, so, you know, our, our you know, major response so far, because it's, you know, 
we're sort of still at the beginning of, of this, you know, large influx of asylum seekers and migrants um, is, you know, we, you know, I don't want to quite say overnight, but pretty close to it, um, opened, um, you know, three hotels, um, one in Brooklyn, one in Queens, and one in Manhattan uh, for asylum seeking families. Um, and so really in the space of just a few weeks, uh, we open those programs and in total that's serving 400 families, um, wow. you know, so it's, you know, well over a thousand people, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, you know, you know, as you said, there are staffing shortages. Um, yeah. We have a lot on our plate, uh, but Samaritan Daytop Village has always been there to meet the needs of, you know, anybody in New York City. Um, and we, we view the, the asylum seekers as New Yorkers. We are a sanctuary city and uh, as well as being responsive to government. So, you know, we, we, we sort of took a deep breath and said, well, you know, how, how are we going to do this? And then it was just a matter, as I said earlier, we, how do we overcome this, uh, you know, given we're already short staffed, uh, but we did it. So we did open those three hotels. We're very proud of that. We've, uh, we had two single hotels for men, for about 160 men, which the city asked us to flip specifically for asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. And so we did that. Um, and then we're fortunate uh, uh, a sort of one of the hedge funds, not, not Robin Hood, but a much smaller one reached out to mm -hmm. us. They wanted to respond to this crisis. They mostly fund things around employment. We had never had a relationship with them, but they heard about the work we're doing with the asylum seekers. Um, and they're going to you know, give us funds specifically uh, both uh, for employment um, skills and to get people you know the jobs as well as some um, you know english as a second language so that people can get better paying jobs and really become a productive member of the workforce so um you know that's what we're doing sort of initially and we're thinking of you know other things but yeah you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're proud that we could uh do that and you know offer you know in total it's about 1500 asylum seekers that um we're housing you know each and every day that's such a huge impact, really, uh, and lasting impact that you're, you're having on these people's lives uh, in this difficult situation is really uh, wonderful. Um, so uh, harm reduction is something that is being embraced by the, you know, on the federal level and the New York state level. Um, how is how is Samaritan Village embracing this harm reduction approach to substance use disorder treatment to prevent overdose deaths, save lives and engage clients? Yep. Um, so, you know, we have embraced it, um, you know, uh, and I would say, you know, fully um, and so many different ways. And, you know, to be honest, it, it's a bit of a culture change, you know, um, for Samaritan Daytop Village itself. So my predecessor, Tino Hernandez, um, you know, really took the agency, you know, quite far uh, to embracing it. So I, you know, I give him a lot of credit for that. Um, but, you know, for many of the staff, you know, many of our staff are in recovery and it's something we're proud of that we hire many staff uh, who, who are in recovery and they did not come through program, harm reduction, you know, the programs. Right. And so they have their own sort of mindsets. Um, so one is, you know, training, you know, you know, sort of agency wide, you know, on, on harm reduction. And, you know, one of the things we keep, uh, you know, saying is this is about saving lives. You know, the unprecedented number of overdose deaths uh, is just, you know, incredible tragedy. They're virtually all, you know, really preventable if you think about it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's taken a bit of a back, you know, burner to the, the pandemic, but it's, you know, obviously killed well over 100,000 lives in, you know, any 12 month period recently. Um, so, you know, you got to save lives. That's the first thing, you know, lives over philosophy, or lives over, you know, whatever you have. Um, mm -hmm. You can't help somebody, you know, uh, deal with their substance disorder if they're not alive. Just, you know, it's, it's a, it, it is a matter of life and death. So, you know, that's our overriding principle. In addition to training our staff, um, we did some training with our board. Um, you know, mm -hmm. so when I knew this was coming, um, you know, rather than go to my board and say, do we want to run this program? It was more educational. Um, mm -hmm. And we're not quite the experts. So uh, I reached out to Joe Turner from Exponents, who is, you know, a leading agency in harm reduction. I asked him if he would present to our board. Um, you know, we have some staff on the, ourselves that, you know, work with him in that presentation because, you know, we do have some experts. Um, but, you know, acknowledging we're not the experts, but, you know, he did it with our board and it was, you know, really, really, you know, superb. Mm. Um, so it, it took all of that. Um, so there was that whole piece, but then you actually have to put it in place. So we're actually working on a pilot at one of our shelters, um, which really had been designated initially as a, a shelter for people, you know, uh, with substance use disorder. Now the city kind of, you know, sort of expand that to include behavioral health issues. 
Um, we're partnering again with Exponents and Housing Works. There's a parking lot right next to the shelter. Uh, they bring their vans where they can, you know, hand out fentanyl strips, uh, give out clean needles, et cetera, education and all that. Um, and it is literally, you know, the parking lot is the parking lot of the shelter. So it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's basically on the premises. Um, and that's been interesting. Again, you know, we have staff raise questions. Wait, you know, some I have some clients who you know don't want to use, but is this you condoning it? Are mm -hmm. we, you know, and all those discussions. Right, it's um, not so black and white. It is, it is not, and so you know, you just have to you you encourage people to express those feelings, and then you talk them through it. So a lot of it is you know, change in mindset, education, and just focusing on saving lives. Um, but you know, we do that, and obviously, of course, we do Narcan training. We've done that for a long time. All of our staff, you know, our clients, we have it everywhere. Um, you know, we have some special funding from the state to coordinate addressing the opioid crisis in three boroughs of New York City. So those people, they're out on the street again, doing, you know, fentanyl testing, um, education. And then it's, you know, engaging people. And it's, you know, there's no caveat that, you know, we're going to do this and you've got to go into treatment. Mm -hmm. um, it's just engaging somebody. Be you going to use, you know, use safer? Don't do it alone these days. That's a good thing for the the pandemic to be alone, but not if you know you're using uh, something. You know, it doesn't matter what drugs you're using these days. Fentanyl is, you know, pretty much laced in everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, you know, really many many layers of integrating into our programs. We have now a standing harm reduction committee where people come together and look at other ways we can incorporate it. So uh, I think it gives you a sense. You know, we've embraced it, but it's an ongoing, you know, um, you know. Uh, work in progress and uh you know we know we save lives and that's the most important thing yeah definitely so we've we've touched on a lot of the challenges that come uh with uh with uh, your work but you know what are some of the highlights and, and and positive things that come with your work as president and ceo of samaritan daytop village sure you know as, as many is you know i take mostly you know i try to get out and about and you know many clients uh you know will come up to me uh, they kind of you know figure out who I am, and they'll just you know. So often, what what I hear a lot is you know not just you know it's great services that you've saved my life. You know I, mm -hmm. I hear that a lot, and it just you know it just yeah you know, warms my heart. Um, mm -hmm. And that is not a rare thing people say, and it's not just clients. I have many you know staff when I go through, they'll see me. You know, there's not a lot of people around. Though, can I speak to you for a minute? Um, and they'll you know reveal to me their choice that, you know, they were a client of Samaritan, they're in recovery. And usually what they just say is the same thing. You know, so I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't be alive if it weren't Samaritan. And they're just incredibly dedicated. They say, you know, I get job offers from other places, but I feel I've got to give back because Samaritan, you know, gave me not only so much, but, you know, gave me my life. So I'd say, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it, it is that. Um, you know, additionally, we mentioned the Richard Trust Wellness Center. You know, I go in this, mm -hmm. this center, um, the buildings at those programs, they were all scattered in that neighborhood and they were mm -hmm. really, uh, you know, we knew we were moving out of them. They were really below our standards. I'll leave it at that. Sure. Uh, but mm -hmm. seeing this beautiful thing with like client artwork on the walls and, you know, clients coming in, it's like, well, it's, you know, they just don't expect that they're receiving services in a place like that. Uh, that makes me feel really good. Uh, the asylum seekers, you know, they had traumatic experiences leaving their home countries. Um, getting to the border, ending up in New York where they may not you know, have planned on coming, you know, the city they don't know, they don't know anybody here, uh, right. but feeling like, wow, I've been welcomed and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and that is just, you know, rewarding. And then certainly, you know, permanent housing, you know, somebody having, you know, their, a key to their own apartment, maybe it's the first time in their whole life, um, you know, the joy they see and same when people get employment. So it's, it's those things that, you know, I refer to as recharge my battery when I go out, I always, I feel I get much more than, you know, uh, than I can give because it's, it just makes me see the, the fruits of the labor, not really of my labor, it's, it's our staff. And, you know, again, all that work is really done uh, by our incredible staff. And, uh, you know, I sometimes, you know, get some of the, uh, the thanks for it, uh, but I know our staff, uh, staff do too. But uh, those are the things that really, you know, make me feel really, really good. Yeah, yeah, it's really uh, the impact you're having on people's lives is is uh, immeasurable, and uh, yeah. That, that's yeah, it's great. Yeah, we serve um, about you know thirty three thousand people a year. Wow, uh, we house every single night about seven thousand people, including twenty two hundred kids. You know, that's a lot of people. Um, and so just you know, I know they're in a safe place. 
Uh, we're doing a big toy drive now. The holidays when every kid have a toy, and you know, knowing that each one of those 2,200 kids at least will get you know one toy for sure. Particularly, you know, uh, people in our shelters of limited means, uh, it just to, to bring joy for the holidays. But you know, we, we try to do that each and every day of the year. Well, uh, I know I speak for many when I uh, say thank you for what you do, uh, and to all your staff. Um, and uh, I, I, I want to also thank you for your time today. It's been such a pleasure to speak with you. No, and thank you. And, you know, your publications are great and, you know, also, you know, really help the field in many, many uh, different ways. And so, uh, you know, it, we're all, you know, stronger and better uh, for all the work that you do. Thank you very much. Uh, for those watching, for more information about Samaritan Daytop Village, please visit SamaritanVillage.org and stay tuned for our next installment of the Behavioral Health News Spotlight on Excellence series. 